Impact of Influence, The Murdoch Family Murders. This is the unfolding story of a powerful South Carolina family, the mysterious deaths they are linked to, and our quest to bring you the truth. Hello, friend. Matt Harris and Seton Tucker. So grateful you are spending some time with us. Murdoch Podcast on Facebook, Matt Harris Podcast at gmail.com. Lots of questions. We're going to continue, and we are going to continue with Murdoch. Uh, there still has some legs on that. And we're also looking into some other cases. Feel free to send us your thoughts on cases that uh, you may want us to look into. I have many, many that I've been going through. Now, this episode, Seton, we, I feel like it's almost a disclaimer. Well, we should say our last episode with Creighton Waters was very well received. We've had a lot of positive comments on our Facebook page, Murdoch Podcast. And personally, I've received a lot of messages about how much people loved our interview with Creighton Waters. I don't know if we're going to have the same reaction to this one. Yes, we get a lot of things, a lot of vitriol fired at us when we say anything that's positive about the defense teams. And we, we both truly believe that the individuals, like in Jim and Dick, should not be attacked because they defended someone that you may think is a horrible person. That's a defense attorney is very important. Uh, and so, and we had had Sarah Zarian before. She's polarizing. And uh, but it's uh, amazing to me that uh, they they both were very busy. And Jim Griffin has been offered, you know, is, is being pulled in a hundred different directions by a lot of different major organizations, bigger, way bigger than this podcast. And he has not given a lot of interviews. So yes, and this is I don't know something like forty minutes or so of us talking to them. Then we're letting him say their piece and bringing up things which I hopefully you will find interesting. Uh, so let's tell you who we're going to talk to. That'd be a good idea. Uh, first of all. We have Sarah Azari, who is a white collar and criminal defense attorney, legal analyst, TV host, author, and it says on her Twitter profile, informed and opinionated, not here to make friends. <laughs> and if you follow her on Twitter, it, is, it gets pretty crazy. Yeah. She is not scared to speak her mind. And she also has a show that is on Discovery ID, I believe, every Monday night, Death by Fame. And we've got Jim Griffin. He was one of the defense attorneys, was Dick Arputlin and Jim Griffin, the main attorneys that were on the defense side of the Alec Murdoch double homicide trial. Jim's an accomplished trial lawyer and healthcare lawyer, more than 30 years of experience representing clients in civil and criminal courts at the federal and state level, and representing healthcare providers in some of the most challenging of legal matters. Uh, Jim, thank you so much for taking some time. I know you're being pursued by all kinds of media outlets, and uh, it's very cool of you to sit down and spend some time with us. Thank you, Jim. Happy to do it. And uh, Sarah, Sarah, to you, the most polarizing guest we've ever had on the show. <laughs> <laughs> but we, lo- I know you're busy as well. I love having you on, and uh, thank you for coming on, too. Of course, my pleasure. <laughs> so we're, we're ready to uh, you know, have the people say, why are you having defense attorneys on your show, right? That's going to that's gonna happen again. So just from a uh, we we talked to you a little bit about it, uh, Sarah, last time, but in, in Jim, in your case, are you surprised at the vitriol, the the things that have been sent to you and said to you and emailed to you and phone call, you know, phone calls you've received, simply based on the fact that you defended Alec Murdoch in this trial? So, Matt, there's it's a mixed bag. I, honestly, there there's a huge uh, there's a lot of support out there for Alec, uh, surprisingly so, and it's coming. And and so my inbox and my voice mailbox and my my street mailbox, every day we, we we get letters and and emails and voicemails from people who are supportive. But then there is a vocal group out there that uh, that wish me the worst of in life because I did represent Alec, and and um, they don't have the ability or or seem not to have the ability to appreciate what lawyers actually do. And that, um, and, you know, I think Sarah can speak to this. These are the same people who, who on, on any given Saturday would go to a rally and say, get the government off my back. And then mm-hmm. you got a defense lawyer who's in there trying to protect individual rights against the government. And, and he's um, the second coming of the devil. And so it's, it's kind of difficult. I saw you changed your Twitter handle. 
Even haters have haters. <laughs> <laughs> Even my haters have haters. You, you know, that's something that I said to my daughters uh, a few years ago. Uh, and I don't even know. It came out at like dinner. We were joking around and they were talking about haters. And I said, you know, even my haters have haters. And they think that was the funniest thing. <laughs> and so, um, you know, one of my daughters suggested I put that out there since I was getting so many uh, hate messages during the trial. And uh, it's stuck. I think I'm going to have uh, coffee cups printed up like that and um, T-shirts. And maybe I'll <laughs> sell something to uh, Eric Bland. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah, I want to, to uh, talk about nationally when someone is, is defending someone who's accused of a, of a heinous crime of some sort. Is this a normal reaction that defense attorneys get? Well, I think it depends on the publicity around that case. I mean, Murdoch, to me, was was astonishingly different. You know, I um, I always, again, probably because I'm a defense attorney and like what Jim said, you know, we're, we're often disparaged and not appreciated. I had never seen that type of backlash. You know, they, nobody could really be decent about there. There are, Jim's right. There are a number of people who are, they're, they're intelligent. They understand that this is about the process, not the person. He may have been a liar. He may have been a thief, but you know, this is a murder trial, right? And then there's also a whole other group who just uses common sense, you know, and I see that and I engage with them. But I have never seen that the the people that disagree go on the attack like this. You know, I mean, this is obviously not the first case and it won't be the last case that I comment on. There's a lot of curiosity about why is she so vested in this? Why did she come down to South Carolina? <laughs> you know, it's it's uh, which I'm kind of enjoying, actually, secretly. But um, I know you are. Anyway. I know you are. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I can sense it. <laughs> Seton said, I think she saw a picture I posted with uh, with Dick Harpootlian at the gourmet shop. Um, and she's like, oh, I was there. I ate lunch there literally right after that. So I saw that on, on Instagram. I was like, oh, my gosh. I'm not a stalker, but I did see that. Well, and I had Your picture was up there. You would have had the same attacks, right? Probably. But <laughs> I do think we should actually go into what it was like to represent a friend. How How is that different than just a regular client? Well, and a friend and an attorney, right? I don't know. Jim should have described the relationship because I don't think that like you guys are pals or anything, right? No, know. that's right. And, you know, guys, I have become friends with a lot of my clients. And, and going into this, I mean, Alec and I were not golfing buddies or hunting buddies or anything like that. I I knew of Alec. He probably knew of me. We I have a lot of family from Hampton County, but really my first exposure to Alec was when uh, he and Maggie came to um, to Dick and me to ask us to represent Paul. And that's how I got to know um, Paul and Buster and Maggie and, and Alec. And so, and it just progressed o o over time, you know, and we became friends. Um, because of my representation of Paul. So, so, so to say that, you know, I was buddies with Alec before this began, um, I mean, that's not true, but I, honestly, I've developed a lot of relationships with my clients. One of my best friends is a guy I represented who went to prison for 18 months and he's out and he's wildly successful. And so, so that's not an unusual situation, but to the bigger picture, it's more difficult to represent a friend. I think the, term friendship is used loosely, right? Like in your case, Jim, it was a, more of an attorney-client relationship that you developed with the family, got right. to know them. So friendship, but I mean, there are also times when our friends are real, you know, our friends who we've never had a professional relationship with, we've always had a friendship with, come to us with a problem for themselves or their family or whatever. And that's where you have to think twice and go, do I want this responsibility? Because as we saw, we don't always win. And we get shit up also, right? And so right. want to shit up the friendship, it becomes the bigger issue. So, I mean, and, I, and, yeah. And, that's, and truthfully, I stay away from those cases, mainly because I don't want to charge my friends and right. I don't want to work for free. So, you know. Sort of, <laughs> <laughs> that's another consideration. That's true. Yeah. Um. We talked to uh, Creighton Waters about your request for the, the speedy trial. He wasn't sure of the strategy. Was there a strategy? I don't know if Jim or Sarah can, I guess Sarah can probably. Yeah, Matt, just so you know, you'll know I've got, 
I'm not going to talk about the, our strategic decisions right. with Alex Case. You know, Sarah is very, very knowledgeable about about criminal defense work, and she can speak to that. Hopefully, we'll be retrying this case someday. Yeah, so you can't do the strategy not, thing. Yeah, so my strategy may not have been Jim's because I'm obviously it's not my case, and I don't know all the all the nuances, but. I wondered that when I, because I started following the case when the murders happened and I was like very eager about when this trial, you know, when trials get set, they keep getting moved Mm -hmm. and it got moved a few times. And I thought, okay, so this is, you know, it's like typical murder case. It'll go to trial like in a few years or whatever, you know? And I was shocked that it was going within, you know, six months of him being charged. And so then when the, when the trial began, I realized that there is strategy and maybe Jim, you don't have to correct me. This is just, you know, what I, what I think. Um, I thought that it's because of just the lack of evidence. I mean, it was an embarrassing case for the state. We can't forget that. The fact that um, Murdoch was convicted. I mean, I have my own opinion as to why that is, but it's not because they sat there and they assessed the evidence and they deliberated for hours and decided, you know, it doesn't add up to beyond a reasonable doubt. It's not because of that. Um, The record is still the same record, which is a terrible investigation, destroyed evidence, things they should have done, they didn't do, missed opportunities. I mean, the whole gamut. So uh, when you have a scenario like that, that is exactly when you want to push and and have your client exercise his right to a speedy trial because you don't want them to be sitting out there doing more investigation, you know, filling in the blanks and crossing their T's. You want to get them when they're unprepared. And if you notice, you guys, you know, that the the data from the car was trickling in the last minute. You know, they brought in a bunch of data. So they weren't, they didn't have it all together. And that's exactly when you want to take advantage. I don't know if that's the, the Harpoolian uh, Griffin strategy, but that would be my strategy. Uh, cards and letters to Sarah Azari on, on Twitter. Um, <laughs> but I, one, one quick question before you do, not a question, a comment, just a side note for everybody. I just saw in Charlotte, there's like a six year, there are people in jail right now have been there for six years without having a trial, which I think is unconscionable, but it's happening. So just a side note. I've never gone to trial in six months. Like I've never had a situation like this where the records. Been, but know, six years is a bit much. I mean, that's, that's, you know, it's, for some but there are reasons sometimes it's incompetency that delays, yeah. you know, the defendant can't stand trial. And right. it's definitely not because of our schedules. I'll tell you that. Yeah. Uh, but some other major reason that, that, that might get delayed. Like, yeah, true. Six is a bit much, but there's no saying what the right, number is months or years, but it's certainly not six months. And I was very curious why Jim and Dick were doing that. And then I got my answers very quickly. Sarah, I know you tuned in to this trial every day. And from your viewpoint, what point do you think the momentum shifted in the trial? Was it the OnStar data that we just mentioned came in kind of mid-trial, the financial crime admission, or, you know, maybe Alex's testimony, where did you see the momentum shift in the trial? Well, for me as a lawyer, it shifted when the floodgate opened and all the financial stuff came in. I thought that was the death knell. I thought that is going to change the trajectory of the entire trial. And I t- ended up being correct. I'll tell you why. But uh, <laughs> um, because, for, but I understood as a lawyer, I understood what that means. And to me, it meant character assassination. It meant that now the defense has to make decisions and do things that maybe they otherwise would not. And, uh, and that scared the shit out of me. So, so for me, it was that moment where Newman was like, you know, like no limit on like, no, you know, that that was the event remotely relevant. Did it happen close to June 7th? I mean, there was no limitation whatsoever on what they could bring in just under the guise of motive. And I knew it wasn't about motive. I knew that was bullshit. So for me, it changed at that moment. But in listening to some of the um, juror interviews and, you know, after the trial, I believe for them, it was when Alec testified. I think when the defendant takes the stand, that's the risk that we run. And I absolutely think that Jim and Dick needed to put him on because the admission of the financial information necessitated an explanation by him, not not argument by counsel. So, you know, when the defendant testifies, it becomes all about that person and whether they believe that person. And so here you had a prolific liar um, who had to convince this jury 
about why he lied about that major piece of evidence, the only piece of evidence, which was the kennel video, and expect to, that the jury would believe him. That's a very, very difficult thing to do. You know, I mean, they were watching him and they were saying things like he wasn't crying. I'm like, wait, were you looking at the right person? Because he was bawling the whole time. You know, I mean, they were seeing things that weren't wasn't even happening. So it became about his testimony for them. For right. me, it was about the mission of the financial information. I know. Jim, you probably wish you could say something right now, don't you? Just <laughs> I'm glad I'm on here with Sarah. That's what I'm <laughs> okay. Well, I, when you come to the crying and the body language experts and all this stuff, I see and I have said on this podcast before, it's all just confirmation bias. You know, if you like the, you know, it, it just if you if you don't believe the person, it's fake crying. If you if you believe the person, it's real crying. If they're sitting like this, it means that, you know, I it's it's really a t- tough call once they have their mind made up about that person. But moving on to there, uh, there was all this evidence, and I'm using quoting fingers, that was reported in the media before the trial uh, that like Maggie's car was running at the kennel. I remember is one thing. Yeah, um, she received a text, or she sent a text to a friend, Maggie did, that saying that Alec was up to something fishy. I mean, lots of stuff that... We did not see testimony in trial. Jim, did you did you look into those things and did you wonder why they came out? Um, did they hurt you? Do you have any opinion about all the fake things yeah. that reported? I mean, I, I mean, we know why all that came out. It, well, a lot, a lot of things came out. Uh, there were leaks leading into the uh, well, all throughout the investigation. There were leaks coming um, from either uh, SLED, the Attorney General's office, or local law enforcement, and and. I learned a lot of information about the, you know, the investigation through reading various uh, uh, social media outlets, and 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 so, you know, there was a lot of leaked information. There was a lot of misinformation. I, I tell you, one of the most uh, angry times I got leading up to it, even before he was charged, was when People Magazine ran a story. Um, at, they claim they still stick by the story that that Maggie was seeing a. A divorce lawyer. She had hired a forensic accountant, and uh, and then this that she was lured to Moselle. I mean, none of that was true. I mean, when when I when I um, heard about the People Magazine story, the first thing I did was pick up the phone and called her sister, and she said, "Jim, uh, if if that was going on, I would know about it." And it was not going on. And and I can tell you that Sled investigated um, Alex and every allegation of any uh, cheating on his wife or any affairs and and. I mean, it was just a dry hole, and but you know, a fair amount of that had been reported and and been accepted as fact in different different places, and and so you don't know what the jury has actually heard. You know, they all swear that they will uh, put aside any information. There's no way to pick a jury um, in the state of South Carolina that didn't know about this case. So, um, well, and you guys tried, right? Didn't you go to different counties around to see if you could? Yeah, right. so uh, yeah, well, leading into it, we did different focus groups from different places. I mean, everybody knew about the case. You know what? And 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 Jim knows this too, probably from using jury consultants. But when you talk to jury consultants about uh, this sort of confirmation bias and, and information that jurors might have, the danger of it is that even when they learn that that what they thought was true is not true and that is not evidence, it's very difficult to undo the opinion that they formed based on the alternative facts or non-facts, right? The fiction. Um, that's the problem. It's like, it's not, you, it's not that you're reteaching something, you know, to a jury. It's just that it, once that opinion forms, it's very hard to undo it. And I, thank God I don't practice down there. <laughs> well, I mean, leaks aren't unusual in major high profile cases, right? Sarah, you could talk from a national, the, the other story, cases you've covered, right? That's not out of no leaks character. are not no leaks are not unusual, but that's the you know, but but I practice in a far larger jurisdiction. Oh, I got you. Uh, and the so jury pool's bigger. The yeah. jury pool's bigger. I still run the same risk that Jim was talking about, but less of a risk than being in uh in in the small community down there, which you know, for a long time have been there was the buildup of anti Murdoch, you know, let's bring him down, let's bring the family down you know, with podcasts and all all that stuff. So let's actually talk about the media. Uh, you know, national news, this case was broadcast on court TV and law and crime and just followed intently by lots of people all around the country. How was it like 
to conduct a trial in this atmosphere? You know, participating in it, we, we were in a bubble in, in a lot of ways. So I did not really appreciate how how intensely the following was until after it was over. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll tell you, just dealing with all, li- all these live mics in the courtroom was uh, an issue. I had one instance during the trial, I received an email from somebody in Iceland and telling me that I needed to cover my mouth when I spoke with Alec because he can read lips. And yeah. so he's reading oh, lips wow. in really? Iceland. Yeah, and, and so then um, as the trial wore on and, and and we got into really the meat of the case toward, and particularly in the defense case, I mean, it, it was packed in the courtroom. And Yeah, people and, were lining up it, at 6 a.m. Oh, earlier than that, I've been told. Mm-hmm. But but it, it became sort of a, a sporting event type atmosphere in there. And, and honestly, spectators were cheering and clapping whenever the judge would rule against us. And, and you know, it was bothersome. It really was because I noticed that and that really bothered me. I was very bothered by it. I'm very bothered by it still. And, and I don't know, you know what to do about it. And because it's something I've never experienced before. And and you wonder how that impacts the jury. We were doing this outside the courthouse? No, in, no, the, in, in the room. In the room. In the room. Courthouse. People the courthouse. were cheering, actually yeah, kind of cheering. Just, Why you know, were they not admonished by the judge? Because the jury. Well, he did. He did. You know, when I got slapped down a few times, when I say slapped, <laughs> I mean, you know, figuratively. Metaphorically. But, um, you know, I, I, they, they would cheer. Sometimes they would clap. And then, you know, the we would get word to the judge because we didn't want to make it um, anyway. Then he would come in and tell everyone to behave and they would be removed. And so then, but after you get a whole new crowd in the next day and they'd still be doing the same stuff. So that, I mean, that was a problem and it was a big problem and we didn't know. And but in terms of, I think people are interested to know, I always get asked if, and I'm sure your viewers, um, Seton and Matt want to know, like, you know, is when there's cameras on you in a courtroom, does that, sort of change uh, your performance. And we are performers, right? We are storytellers. But to me, it doesn't. I'm so immersed in the job and immersed in what, I, I don't even notice anything that's happening. I mean, how did that impact you, Jim? Uh, you, you know, I was, but, you know, this was, I mean, I'm showing my age, but, you know, there was a time when I used to play sports and, you know, you'd have audiences coming to your, whether it's basketball, football, and I was a big tennis player and you get focused on the game and you ignore the people around you. And that, that, and I've been in a lot of big trials and it's the same experience. I mean, you focus on what you're doing. You don't really know who's in the courtroom and and the cameras are, I mean, you don't even think about the cameras until somebody emails you from Iceland and telling you to cover your mouth. When you're trying to talk. <laughs> well, you mentioned your daughters. Did, did your daughters chime in on your tie or your, uh, you know, your daughters tell you, hey, dad, you got to, you know, powder your forehead or. Yeah. So, that, yeah, they, they did keep me, uh, <laughs> keep me. But earlier in one of the pretrial hearings, we had a live mic and I didn't know it. My daughter was texting me. So, dad, we can hear every word you're saying. And, and you know, I was. Oh, my God. Uh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was recently uh, uh, called out falsely, obviously, by Bland, about, you weren't there, you don't know. And I was like, I was watching every day, all day long, (laughs) you know, but you weren't physically there. I'm like, what would I gain by being physically there? I was watching the trial, you know? Anyway, but yeah. yeah. I mean, you you had a speech that was obviously international. I mean, there were people, there were people on Twitter that, uh, uh, you know, from the UK, there's a lot of people that were really into it. The, the world watched, you know, and followed. One, one, one thing I will, I, I do want to throw this out there. So this was, in a, you know, the first experience for me is that on the weekend, I would try to catch up and, you know, by seeing people's reaction and, and probably the worst source of information was, you know, sort of trolling Twitter on the weekends. Yeah. To see what the was. It's a terrible place. But yeah, I know it's such a toxic environment, but, um, but, and and then and honestly, that's how Sarah and I became friends because she was watching it every day, and I met her over Twitter, and and she was you know taking out for us, and and you know we started communicating on Twitter, and then she she called me, and and so at the end of every day, frankly, I would end up talking to Sarah to get her assessment of what how she thought the trial went, you know, just a fresh set of eyes who's not in the pit with us, and 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 that was a um, 
you know, very helpful. I mean, you always like that. And, and the fact that it was on trial, I was able, and, and Sarah wasn't the only person that I talked to, but, um, you know, I, I was able to get feedback during the trial. And, and frankly, the feedback we were getting was pretty much, oh, it's going to be a hung jury. It's going to be a hung jury. And, you know, so we're starting to believe that. And then it wasn't. Twitter is, they're not a little nutty out there, but I, I would imagine you can take a, Let's say there's a bunch, I'm just going to randomly make something up, not necessarily, but maybe people go like, there's a whole bunch of Twitter people going, I don't understand the timeline. I don't understand the timeline. You can kind of reset in your head maybe and like, okay, right. I, I, I want to do something about that. I'm, I'm just making the yeah, timeline I, as an example, but I mean, you can use the masses as kind of a laboratory. Something to way. clear up. Yeah. Or something to clear up or, or something to em- emphasize, you know, as the trial goes forward for sure. And and I and I gotta tell you, during the course of the trial and my inbox was was full every day, just about the uh and a lot of messages were I came into this uh, believing he was guilty and believing he did it, and now, you know, I've got nothing but doubt. I mean, there was a lot of that going on that, that we had flipped a lot of people, but um there was also a group of lawyers on uh Twitter that I connected with a, a for former public defender of 18 years from Santa Barbara, California. Just like I connected with Jim, I connected with her. Like we ended up talking on the phone and, you know, if I was going to step out and was going to miss like, I don't know, 15 minutes of a testimony, I was like, you need to take notes and send me your yeah. notes, <laughs> yeah. which is crazy over the whole thing. But, uh, you know, we, we would think about like, okay, well, did you understand, you know, initially like the two shooter theory, for example, was a little confusing to me. And then, and then I, understood it um or a timeline or whatever time of death and if you wanted to have an intelligent conversation about it you could and if you wanted to engage decently about it on twitter you could but then unfortunately there were all the trolls who were coming out about you know he was already convicted he was already and it's done. fair for someone to i mean and i'm not saying this case but some people were fair in saying i think he did it but as from a case standpoint i don't see it that you know it, it, they're not convincing yes. me. That's a fair assessment to have, Absolutely. right? I mean, that right, Sarah. I'll say one Sarah. Is Jim like that. One is you're based on the evidence. Right. One is your feeling. One is based on the evidence. Yeah. Let's talk about this week. Um, what happened? There was some telephone conversations that happened between you and Ellick during the trial, and those were released, I believe, on a podcast. It seems crazy that this happened. Uh, Jim, tell us. Yeah, so I, I I got an email Saturday morning. Today's Thursday, so I don't, you know, this past Saturday morning when I woke up at six thirty from some citizen saying, "Hey, Mr. Griffin, you need to know this is on TikTok. It's a it's a recorded call from you and Alec." And so I played it, and sure enough, it was my voice. It was a, it was a recorded call, and, and I was, um, you know, it, and it was a short conversation it was about the fifth time alec had called me that night i I remember it very well and i was coming down with a cold and i was i was needing to go to bed and i was trying to get off the phone so we really weren't talking uh, although he was he was referencing something that had happened in court and he was wanting to reassure me that i was uh that he thought i did a great job but he thought something else needed to be emphasized a little further and and I was very alarmed that that happened. So I immediately, uh, Saturday morning, sent an email to, to the captain over the jail who I'd gotten to know because we visited with Alec a lot and they were very helpful and accommodating. And so I said, I forwarded that to, to her and I said, please tell me what has happened here. You know, I need to know how many of my calls have been released. Uh, what, what are they and why they were released? And, and, to this day, I've not gotten a response, to be honest with you. I know Sheriff Hill issued a statement to Fox News, I think, or or at least I read it on, on Fox News, that uh, that it was human error, which I understand human error, and that it was only an isolated incident. And But the the podcast folks said it was 28 uh, recordings, and so that, that alarms me, and I haven't wow. gotten to, I wow. haven't, I haven't gotten answers yet. I want answers, and I really want to answer the question as to, who was listening to my phone calls and why were they being recorded? Now I know there are recording systems in place and, but it's usually pretty automated. It's off site, and the lawyer's number is off limits unless they make Mm -hmm. some showing to a court 
that they have entitlement to, you know, and, and they set up, you know, you know, a, a, a wall so that, you know, you'd have some tain attorney review it for, and that's really when the lawyer's under investigation as well. So exactly. it, you know, it's total BS that they were recording my calls. And, and it makes me wonder, you know, so, you know, was someone listening to our conversations? So that's so, I, yeah, I don't, know, I, don't know. I don't have the answer to that. I, I don't have the answer to that. When I learned that this had happened, I, I think I confirmed on Twitter that I was mad as hell. And I, and I am. I am mad as hell about that. So you're saying that normally there's a, uh, something in place, because I just imagined somebody there gets the FOIA request and they send all the calls without even no. questioning it. But you're saying there should be something in place that doesn't record the, like say, attorney's numbers. It, it autom almost automatically does not record those numbers. Normally, that's the situation. So this has happened to me as well, not on a not on a high profile case, but but it was very clear that the DA on one of my cases said things to me very <laughs> angrily that she could have only heard me say to my client. So it was clear that she listened to the conversations. But typically, there's a service, there's an outside service that uh, the jails use where you pay so you can prepay for these calls, right? That your client makes to so they don't have to pay for it. And your number as a lawyer is registered. It's not really exempt from recording, but it's exempt from being being listened to and monitored. Okay. Right? So they're not even supposed to like they 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 would very easily know Jim's number is the lawyer number, right? And mm. and those calls should not be produced, you know, listened to or anything like that. And like Jim said, the only time they really do that is if the attorney's under investigation, like we've had lawyers who, you know, have been witness tampering or like, you know, basically commission of a crime, like talking to the client about, well, maybe we should bribe this person not to show up to court, da, 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 you know, that's the kind of context within which there's, and then you still have to go to court and get permission to do that. You don't gotcha. just do that. So it's outrageous. It's outrageous. Before we move to a statement you released on behalf of Buster, let's just cover one other quick thing. Leading up to the trial, we heard a lot about this white T-shirt that Ellick was wearing the mm -hmm. night of the murders, and this was not presented as evidence to the as it was to the grand jury during the trial. Does this have any sort of legal implication? The, the, the fact that it was presented to the grand jury and not to the uh, to the actual trial jury, you know, that's something we're evaluating. Frankly, that information didn't come out until trial. And one one thing you need to know. And people probably don't understand is that that local county grand juries are not uh, there's no record of what's presented to the grand jury. Oh, there's wow. no court reporter. Insane. And it is insane. And so you, so there's there's nothing in there. And 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 we did not learn until testimony that came out in trial what was actually told to the grand jury. And the reason that we um, reason I knew enough to ask the question is because we were producing an outline of the witnesses that he had prepared for his oh, grand jury testimony. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. And so, so I had that. And so I asked him, did you tell the grand jury, you know, what's in your outline? He said, yeah, I did. And so, so we have that, you know, is that something that, um, that we're going to do anything about in the future? Um, yeah, we're looking at it. That's all I can say. And so if people don't know also not only well in this case i did not even I had no idea there was no record of what was being presented but uh there's no defense attorneys in there it's uh, just the the da or the ag or whatever it is uh, well, and it, they are in there and it's yeah, it, the old it's saying is you can a, a ham sandwich or whatever the saying is right there's there's no opposition without a doubt there's no opposition they're not normally there's not even a a da in there it's just an a d officer and i can tell you from experience on both sides of the of, you know, I, I've done it as a, a system solicitor. I've done it as a uh, federal prosecutor, but but more so at the state level. The only time you get a no bill is when the solicitor goes in there and tells the grand jury, look, this is a case um, that, you know, we need, you need to look at. We don't think there's enough evidence here. And basically the prosecutor tells them to no bill it. And that's when it gets no bill. But short of that, they will indict a ham sandwich. <laughs> yeah, but in this case, not only you would never have that, but but also there was exculpatory evidence that the lead investigator Owens didn't present. So that the you know lying about the con 
lack of whatever the blood, the human blood on the t-shirt pursuant to confirmatory test was in his email for five months. Right. That was you know, where you argued, uh, you know, the dog ate your email. And then there was the loading of the gun, which you said was trickery by in his own words. So those are like, you know, I'm not saying that based on those, he wouldn't be indicted, but still ex- very, very exculpatory uh, evidence that was not presented. So, I mean, I don't, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't like grand juries to begin with because I can't be there. I can't poke yeah. holes in the case, but this is even worse because you don't even know what was said and what was testified to. You're like completely excited, completely. How do you guys feel about as defense attorneys when, and just, we'll take it away from the Murdoch case, say, but law enforcement says to someone that they know something they don't know, or they, they give them trickery which is technically legal, right? To say, I found such and such item in that person's room. I found a rain jacket at the back of the property. Right, example. Um, How do you guys feel about that? I don't like it. Clearly, I don't like it. They do it. uh, Usually they do it in the context of, you know, it's sort of an interrogation. You'll say, one guy's in the next room. He's rolling on you. You better better get in. Otherwise, you're going to be the last man out. And so that's how they... That's how they flip people by misleading them as to who's cooperating. Um, I, I think there's some limitations as to how much false information you can you can give, and it and it leads to a confession. I mean that that um, and that's that's problematic. But you, you know, you know it's a case that comes to mind. Another high profile case um, with documentaries was uh, making a murder. The right. interrogation yeah. of nephew was horrific oh, awful the way yeah they, yeah and and if you you know when you when you look at it's completely legal there's a supreme court case about it you can use trickery in an interrogation but there's like jim said there's a limit and when you look at the psychology of it they put you in a cold room you're hungry you're freaking out you're panicked um you don't know where you are you don't know what you're saying and then add to the trickery it's very easy to get out of somebody what you want them to say you, you can know, implant, they've proven you can implant memories in people that weren't there, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. So anyway, that's a little side note. I mean, there's so many false confessions out there and people think, how could you falsely confess to something you didn't Very do? Easy. But, but they do it because they just hot bots them and lie to them and, and won't let them see anybody, won't let them out. And, and, and then they go back and say, well, you never asked for a lawyer. Well, you know, is that right? There's usually no recording of that. But. Yeah. People are suspicious because uh, I always tell Seton if she goes missing, I'm lawyering up right out of the gate. And they're saying, you shouldn't say that before anything happens. <laughs> I shouldn't well, say that. Now, now you've recorded that. <laughs> yeah, that's hot. That's highly recommended. I, I think Sarah was on a national morning talk show about when do you need a lawyer? And you know, when Popo's at your door, you need a lawyer. You don't need to be talking with them. We talked about cameras in the courtroom, which is going to lead us into Buster because you know, I, I felt bad that there was a lot of close-ups of Alex's family members who were not, at this moment, accused of anything. Um, was that bothersome? I, I assume you're friends with the family. Was it bothersome to you? No. We wanted we wanted the jury to see the family in the courtroom sitting on our side of the aisle and supporting uh, Alex. Um, it was... You know, unfortunate that during the course of the trial, the family was moved to the back row of the front section. And based upon, you know, some rule violations, which no one knew that the rules were. I mean, it was like Alex not supposed to look or speak, you know, mouth words to his family. And 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 then there was an the issue with a book being passed through a paralegal to Alec and the and there was a bomb, the bomb threat, and Alec left with the book before we had it cleared, and all you know. Oh, that, that was during all, the bomb threat. Yeah, oh, wow. I mean that's how that came up, and such bullshit, to be honest with you. But um, but then the family got shuffled to the back row, and that's why you noticed during the trial we uh we had Buster stand up a few times so the jury would know, hey, they've been pushed to the back row, and hey, there they are. But um, but so. But Jim, you know what the funny part was when everyone was saying that. Oh, the privilege that that they think that they can pass a book. I'm like, please, that shit happens in all my cases. It's not a privilege issue. It's not a Murdoch issue. It's a defendant issue. You know, families, they haven't seen each other. They They send messages. They They tried to make a thing out of Buster, like 
chewing his nails and saying he was flipping somebody off. But I mean, but, 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 you know, passing a book, you know how many things people have tried to pass, you know, to my families, you know, notes, cigarettes. I mean, there's all kinds of shit. Like it's not because they think, you know, because they, they feel entitled to like the Murdoch, you know, privilege entitlement. It's just, it's just, the, it's just their name. It's human nature. They haven't seen their, you know, their loved one and, and they, they try, you know, and, I talk to them, you know. They're exactly right. Honestly, Alec, Alec had not seen, had not physically put his eyes on any of his family members since that September roadside shooting. Well, I, actually, when they took him to, they took him to, to the place in Atlanta, they took him to Orlando, and then they, they drove him to Hampton. But since that, that September period, they had, he had not seen them in person. So. Does he not have dr- jail visits? Can they not go visit him in jail? No, you, you know, uh, COVID quarantine, the oh, only yeah. uh, the only visits, I mean, you could go to the jail and you could get on a, a video telephone. I mean, it, it's so antiquated. The system is a grainy photo that you could see him back in the cell. I mean, so, yeah, no, you, you can't see him in person. So we mentioned Buster, uh, and you released a statement on behalf of him uh, about the Stephen Smith case. Do you want to expand on that and, and, and the reason why you did it? Well, so, yeah. So there was an effort by uh, Ms. Smith to raise money to exhume Stephen Smith, which, you know, I feel for her. Losing a child is is probably one of the worst things that could ever happen to uh, to a parent. And I said, and I will say, there's probably no greater grief than that. And um, and so she's entitled to her answers. What? But what's happened is, you know, the story is is linked to the Murdoch name and it's, and more specifically to rumors about Buster and, and, and Buster went for a long time, just, you know, ignoring it, hoping it would go away and, and it just wouldn't go away. And then they started this effort up, you know, exhuming Stephen Smith's body. There was a, there was a show on like Wednesday night, I think Then on Thursday, there was a New York post article. Then on Friday, I got a call from a national reporter that, reporter that said uh, they're going to do a, a segment on it on Monday on the one of the national morning talk shows. And, and, uh, and she asked if, if, you know, she could get a statement from Buster. And then I talked to Buster and, you know, I, and I talked to some people who are in the media and who, who adv- give this type of advice. And, and the point there was, you know, as, until he goes out in public and, and strongly denies it, it'll continue r- running and not that his denial will stop it, but it will certainly make it, um, it would certainly require the, who's ever running the story to run his denial. And, and so that, that's what he did. And, and, and I got to tell you, it, you know, we drafted the, the uh, statement for him, but he redid it and the, the emotional and personal stuff in there about his grief is all his words and, 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 and other things in there. And, and so it, it was a genuine heartfelt statement from Buster. And, you know, I, by the way, you know, the Smith story, I've been saying this on, on uh, news shows that there is that story, um, hate crime, non hate crime, but that kind of roadside assault, whether it's hit and run or otherwise, I mean, around the country and local news, I want Sandy Smith to get the closure that she needs, whatever that means. But this story would have never gotten national attention, but for the fact that they spinned it into a buster connection with him and then with the death. I mean, if you take out Murdoch from the story, this would be another local roadside death. You know, it would not be we would not be covering it. We would not be unpacking it. And my question is um, legitimately, I, 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 I mean, uh, I think Jim knows the answer is like, is she even going to know anything more exhuming the body if it's ordered? Because now sled has come and said it was a murder. It was a homicide. I mean, it was a murder. It was a murder, not, not a hit and run. So 
I mean, exhuming the body does not identify a suspect. It just tells you the manner in which he was killed. Was it by a car or was it by physical assault? Now that Sledder has already come out and said it was a murder, it, I mean, is there really a point to exhume the body? I, I can't ima imagine what they could find by exhuming the body that, that would tell them, you know, who rather than how. And I just, I mean, DNA doesn't last eight years on, on a body. DNA um, uh, evaporates, disintegrates. When, but they did when a rape kit killed. at the time. Yeah. They did a rape kit at the time. And they x-rayed him. They did an autopsy. They have photos. I mean, you know, Sarah's seen autopsy photos. They're not pretty. These are dead bodies that are cut up and they're extra. I mean, they're just okay. autopsy photos take a pretty strong stomach to look at. And But, you know, they have all that. So I don't know. I don't, yeah, can you can you share that thing about the 1915 South Carolina case? Because yeah. I'm obsessed. With that. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, so when the, the, this effort went underway and these lawyers are out there saying, you know, they're, they're going to go to court and exhume the body. I was like, well, how do you do that? So I researched it, and there's no procedure uh, in South Carolina law for a private citizen to exhume a relative. That, but there's been efforts not many and the reported case law and the, you know, really the, the one case that talks about it the most is from 1915. And, and, and it, you know, it, it just talked about how you don't disturb a body once it's put in the earth and, and it, it's biblical. Um, it says, you know, if you believe in the Bible, then you believe the human body is made in God's image and that when it's put in the earth, it, it's, you know, back to dust, dust to dirt, mm. dust to dust, and it should not be disturbed. Uh, um, absent some very compelling circumstances. And so that that's that's the so I, I think when you when you couple that with the idea that you're not gonna get anything more than what Sled has already said, that it's a murder. I mean the the, the ba if the court does a balancing, which often courts do in these situations, um I don't I don't know what the the gain is except for to continue to use the Murdoch name and Buster, you know, and the Chirons to say is, you know, is this the next Murdoch murder, you know, case or whatever, you know. I personally respect the family's wishes to do whatever they want in efforts if with this investigation. Um, but I do want to ask, have they has law enforcement reached out to Buster personally and has he cooperated? Yeah, so this is the interesting part, and, and I, I was asked this and I confirmed it with Buster yesterday. Uh, he, uh, you know, Buster's name was mentioned early on as as rumored, and that and that was in 2015. But he he had no one, no law enforcement agent has ever reached out to him to interview him in connection with Stephen Smith's death. No, no highway patrol investigators did it in 2015. No sled agent has done it since 2021. And and what we read in the um, what we read in the sled press release is they're making. Good progress. Well, if they're making progress, it obviously doesn't involve Buster because they're not even asking him about it. And so, and and I think uh, someone reported this morning that you know Buster was on their radar. He's been on their radar. Well, you know they know about Buster. They know about these rumors, but they're not looking at Buster as far as I know. And so, you know, I, I really they do. do have, they do have Stephen's phone, right? So that could be what they're investigating. Connections. My understanding is they've had the. They, they got his phone when they took over the case. They have the ability to look in it. And so I hope they get, I hope they find who did it very quickly. And I hope it will exonerate Buster. I know it will exonerate Buster. And then I think everyone can move on with his life. Yeah. We all, we all hope that for sure. And, uh, you know, at the beginning, you could say, all right, they didn't interview him because he's a Murdoch, but <laughs> that doesn't matter anymore now. They'd sure as heck go after him if they thought, Right, got a connection, right? Um, right. Do you have any insight into the the rumor or word that Alec and Randy got involved in Stephen Smith early on? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Randy was representing um, Stephen Smith's father in a workers' comp case, so there was a there was an existing attorney and client privilege relationship. He goes to the accident scene. Um, my understanding is to to you know, investigate and maybe bring what's called a John Doe action, a John Doe lawsuit on behalf of Stevens estate. And what a John Doe lawsuit is, is if, if, if you're in an automobile accident and it's a hit and run, you're in, uninsurance, you're, 
you have an insurance policy that covers liability. You also, that, that policy covers when you're hit by an uninsured motor, motorist. And your uninsured portion of your policy kicks in if it's a hit and run. And so there would be money there. And that's my understanding. The reason he went there is to, he's a personal injury lawyer. He's a wreck lawyer. And in Hampton County, I doubt there's a wreck that that someone in that law firm doesn't know about. And isn't that a term not to denigrate uh, PI lawyers, but isn't that the term and <laughs> ambulance chasing kind of when you show up? At the My spot. mind was it, going there, but I didn't want to say it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Sarah. All right. Thank you, Jim. We'll thank talk you. Soon. Bye, guys. All righty. Reach out to us, Murdoch Podcast Facebook, with your comments or Matt Harris Podcast at gmail.com. You have a very special shout out. Yes. I want to give a shout out to my sister who is actively in labor right now. And oh. we don't know if she's having a boy or a girl. So push, push, no, push. Don't say that. That sounds weird. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> very excited to find out if I have a new niece or nephew. And a shout out to my friend, Ashley Anderson, who's a TV anchor on WCCB and commented how much Seton you have grown over since the beginning of the podcast she thinks it's uh, amazing and she's so proud of you oh that's super cool because I do feel like I, I will take it as a compliment because I do sure. feel like I've improved a lot along the way sure, and you have uh this one from Tom he drives Florida Colorado Utah Wyoming Montana Florida so he, he's, he's been all over the place and he says I appreciate at least five things about your podcast first that you work very hard to humanize the victims of Murdoch I'm writing just having listened to the episode where people in the community were expressing their commitment to Miss Satterfield. And any other form of media about this story is likely that Miss Satterfield might be not be named beyond being referred to as the housekeeper who died in a fall. Her situation discussed at all, Miss Satterfield is a victim that you give life to. You also give life to Mallory Beach and Stephen Smith. Second, you give depth to the community beyond, beyond that is the home of the wild Mr. Murdoch. We have tried to do that, and Sarah has helped us a lot with that. Third, you have credibility to the legal profession. Uh, John Snyder is very earnest and straightforward and clear in his discussions of the finer points of the law and uh, makes it easy for the layman to understand some of these things. Fourth, you give depth into the situation by bringing on guests knowledgeable in the various aspects of the case, coroners, 911 call agents, journalists, weapons experts, banking experts, etc. Fifth, and most importantly, you and Seton conduct your podcast in both an informal and informational manner feels like I am learning right along with you, while at the same time you are taking the right to provide depth that I could never get on my own. We're only on episode 62, but I look forward to more long drives for a chance to see the story unfold, even knowing how the murder trial ends. Well, thank you. We that. appreciate you getting us and our concept. <laughs> the, kind of, which we, we never, the concept was, let's go in and just, yeah, but it worked out pretty well. It did, but we like to learn along the way. I mean, I think that as yes. our guests have really been our, our shining stars, not us. And Dwayne has been our shining star. Dwayne is our producer. How do they find you? Where do they find you, Dwayne? Sugar Shack or Sweet Shack or Love Shack? Or- <laughs> Crown Town <laughs> Records. Yeah, Crown Town Records. There you go. And Or reach out to me. And we'll hook you up with uh, Dwayne and, and Tika Kay. And uh, I do a radio show on the new Mix 107.9 in Charlotte. You get a 107.9 or the Mix 107.9.com. You want us in, um, in the morning, 6 to 10. I will be there. And thank you again. We're grateful and we'll talk soon.